book is sort of like, what if Frozen's Elsa was not the Ice Queen and hooked up with that guy from Baldur's Gate? And also the setting is Icy Gladiator. Hi, my name's Rachel, and today we're talking about Romanticy again. We're doing an in-depth review of the adult Romanticy, The Frost Queen's Blade, a Romanticy where the love interest is based off of Astarian from Baldur's Gate. I don't play that game, but I do know that many of you play that game, and thirst over this man, this man who also thirsts for blood. The love interest doesn't do that in this book, but the main character does, but not in the way you're thinking. I should, in theory, have liked this book. I mean, my god, the dedication is to Maximus from Gladiator, which is my thing. Unfortunately, this was another romanticy miss for me, and I am going to explain why. I am trying very hard to find a romanticy this year that I will rate five stars, but so far it's been duds. I can see myself potentially giving at least two romanticy books five stars this year. Speaking of seeing, I'm doing that quite well. Thank you so much. Thanks to GlassesUSA.com, which is where I got my glasses. If you don't know, GlassesUSA.com is one of the biggest eyewear retailers in the United States, offering thousands of eyeglasses and sunglasses in brands such as Ray-Ban, Gucci, Oakley, and many more. They also offer contact lenses. I have multiple frames from GlassesUSA.com that I love. I love their Amelia E brand. These are their Amelia E brand sunglasses that I have. These are my favorite sunglasses I've ever owned, and they are in my prescription so I can see no matter what, and I don't have to like double up like a goofball. These are probably my favorite eyeglasses. I like to look like a millennial hipster at all times, so these are my favorites for that purpose. The best thing about GlassesUSA.com is that glasses start at just $39, which is up to 70% off of retail prices. GlassesUSA.com has recently launched a gorgeous collection handpicked and curated by the amazing actress Marseille Martin, inspired by her advocacy for positive representation and breaking barriers. And you can check out this collection exclusively on GlassesUSA.com by clicking the links in my description. And if you love any of these frames, there's an exclusive offer waiting for my followers that you can snag by using that link below. And if you're a contact lenses girly, no problem. In fact, GlassesUSA.com is the perfect place to stock up on your contact lenses. And save. You can get 25% off all contact lenses, Vista, AccuView, Biofinity, and many more. They're available with any prescription for all users. Shopping online can be fun. I like to shop online quite often, but I like using GlassesUSA.com for shopping online for glasses specifically because they have AR virtual try-on. I used it to pick out all of the frames that I've gotten from them. It's super helpful. You can actually see what the glasses are going to look like on on you before you buy them. And GlassesUSA.com is a risk-free shopping experience with free shipping and returns and a 100% money back guarantee within 14 days. And again, they are offering an exclusive discount for my followers on top of any coupon they currently have going on the website, but it's only available for 24 hours. So click that link in my description to get started and get all the details. And thank you so much to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring today's video. Okay, Frost Queen's Blade, here we go. Content warnings that were listed in the book, which I super appreciate. Authors, highly recommend when you do this, it lists explicit sex scenes, blood play, and knife play. Remember how I referenced the bloodthirst earlier? Yeah, it's a, it's a sexual thing. Blood play and knife play references to suicidal ideation, slavery shown in a negative night, negative light, light gore, references to abusive parenting. I'm not sure that I would call the gore light. I'm not sure that I would call it light. I would just say gore. Not a bad thing, I'm just, I, I'm thinking like, that's pretty subjective and I'm not sure that personally I would call this light. Like we have descriptions of chopped off heads. So I would say probably not light gore. We have a prologue that set us up in a way that I thought this was gonna be harder hitting than it was. In the prologue it says, what most historians routinely fail to understand or for that matter convey is that Queen Elma of Rothen was neither hero nor traitor nor figure of legend. She was simply a woman. Excerpt from The Ice Queen by Harriet Moss, Cornelian Tower Archives. I was like, oh, we're doing excerpts from books, but then we didn't really do that. So I was disappointed. I love books within books. Now, I thought that we were going to have a Queen Elma that was like Queen Elsa, where we have ice powers, but the similarity stops at the name. They don't look alike. This book is sort of like, what if Frozen's Elsa was not the Ice Queen and hooked up with that guy from Baldur's Gate and also the setting is Icy Gladiator 
Yeah, let me read you the actual synopsis for this. A reluctant queen, a deadly assassin, a deal bound in blood. Conspiracy lurks in the realm of Rothen. No one knows this better than Elma Volta. I'm just gonna stop there. I don't like the name. I think that we could have done better. It just sounds a little silly. Elma Volta, soon to be queen of the Frozen Kingdom, but as she awaits her coronation, Elma narrowly escapes death at the hands of an enemy assassin. Realizing she has few choices and even fewer allies, Elma offers the assassin a deal. If he can keep her alive, and until she takes her rightful place on the throne, she will bring peace to their warring lands. An uneasy alliance forms between Elma and the sharp-tongued assassin, but what started as mutual hatred and resentment soon begins to evolve into something else entirely. Something aching, desperate, and blazing hot. I feel like we should have cut that last. <laughs> so Elma was raised not near her parents. She was raised out in a different area by three women, and I thought we were going to see this more and see how it like impacted who she was as a person. Unfortunately, we didn't really do anything with this. It was just like, by the way, the reason that Elma is not as mean and awful as her dad is, is because she was raised elsewhere until she was an early teenager. That's it. Hi from the void. I just real quick wanted to explain that Elma was raised in Mechia by these three women who she considered her mothers and she never really knew her parents and their kingdom that she is from is called Rothen and Rothen's capital is is called Frost City. And then their enemy, where the Baldur's Gate guy comes into play is from, is Slodava, which is across the Frozen Sea. So we have Slodava, where Baldur's Gate guy is from, Rothen, where Elsa is from, and then Mechia is where she was raised, which is their ally, and Neveni, which is another ally. We don't see either of those places on page. We stay in Frost City and Slodava. Okay? Okay. All in all, I would say that this this book would have benefited from like 75 extra pages of building out our world a little bit more. Well then her mom died and she was sent back to live with her dad. Her dad sent her away in the first place to keep her safe and I don't understand why after her mom died he thought that it was best if she came back because if her mom wasn't safe then why should we're gonna move on so she's an adult now they're at court she's with her dad and this dude shows up and he's like for you princess elma and it's bed slaves well-trained bed slaves from Slodava. And the guy who brought these bed slaves to her makes them like kiss and stuff. And she's kind of uncomfortable watching this. But I just want to note that these dudes are from Slodava. And he was offering her bed slaves from Slodava. It's going to be important towards the end of the book. Elma had seen the elusive northern men before, captured spies and assassins from that remote enemy enclave. Slodava was a city-state swathed in shadow and ice, a place that Elma might not have believed existed were it not for all the prisoners she'd seen. So that means that we have Slodavan slaves, right? And captured spies and assassins. And it's somewhat normal to fuck Slodavan bed slaves. That's what this scene is setting us up for. And yet later in the book, after she has in fact fucked a guy from Slodava, Slodavan, a Slodavan guy, she starts to get called Slodafucker. And I'm like, but wouldn't, if there was a, <laughs> there was a negative stereotype against fucking somebody from Slodava, then why was she presented in the first chapter a bunch of Slodavan men to fuck and nobody called her a slow fucker then. I was very confused. And we set up very quickly that her dad is not a good guy. In her first year of life in Rothen, just before her 15th birthday, her father had brought Elma the severed head of her favorite guard. His skull had been sliced from top to bottom at an angle so that only an eye remained and part of a nose and a bloody mush that was his brain. As she stared at the remains of his face and the inside of his skull, blah, 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 basically her dad killed her favorite guard. I don't think that this is light gore that was kind of descriptive, but I'm only pointing this out because later on it says that she sees a severed head for the first time and I'm like but in the first chapter we set up very clearly that her dad was a bad guy because he presented her a severed head of her favorite guard which she saw in great detail and I know because it just got described to us so we have some continuity issues here that are part of the reason why I didn't give this a higher rating and also this is gladiator it was dedicated to gladiator and this is doing gladiator Gladiator. We have a bunch of people fighting and the noble people watching. She had seen death. She cheered it here in the great arena.
arena, she had watched her father grinning beside her as heads rolled on red stained snow. Again, she's seen multiple beheadings. She had seen him execute Slodavin invaders with his own broadsword, teeth bared as he severed their spines, and Elma was no stranger to loss. But nothing somehow had prepared her for the sight of her father the king in death. His face was purple and blotchy, his eyes opened too wide, spittle crusted the corners of his mouth. Oh yeah, her dad dies immediately in the beginning. So now her uncle, Godwin, is like, oh, uh, you're queen now, your father taught you well, and she's like, actually, no, I have no idea what I'm doing. Speaking of not knowing what they're doing, it's me not knowing what I'm doing. I do, I do know what I'm doing. I, I have to film like this because I can't do the full beat and uh, get in my filming setup because I am very sick. And if I get under that ring light, you're gonna see how close to being a corpse I am. So don't leave, we're gonna, I know this is not your preferred setup, but we are gonna film like this the rest of the time, but we are gonna have some fun and talk about where I feel like this went wrong. I mean, this this kind of did what other fantasy romance books did that I, I take issue with, where we are going to make things very obvious up front, and we're not going to do a lot of cultivation of the world that we're in or the side characters, so that when these side characters inevitably betray our main character, it feels very shallow. <laughs> and I don't care, which is a shame because I could care. Like this has the makings of, of me, you know, caring. It just, we didn't cultivate. We didn't take time. Like I said, this needed about 75 more pages. So she's talking to her uncle Godwin and her uncle up front, like in the beginning of the book, and he falls off uh, the map for a little while there and then comes back as the villain. Her uncle up front seems very cool and chill. Then we just make him a completely different character at the end of the book, which is a really lazy way to create a villain. A different but also lazy way to create a twist is what we did with our maid Cora. Cora is very obviously trying to advocate for her family and Elma, our main character, is like, oh I'll help you. And then she finds out she's not allowed uh, because something with Cora's family. They, this, Her father or brother did something, which I'm not sure if that ever got explained. And her uncle Godwin, Elma's uncle Godwin, is like, no, we can't do anything for those people. They're terrible. And Elma's like, oh, what a bummer. Even though she's queen, she could do whatever the fuck she wants. Uh, so we did all this where we're like, oh, I'm going to help you, Cora. Oh, I can't help you, Cora. Now Cora's mad at me and she's turned on me. And like I saw it coming from the jump, which is a shame because we could have, if we had cultivated this relationship, then it would have actually felt like a betrayal when it happened. So her dad dies pretty early on in the book and in chapter four, by chapter four rolls around, her dad, the king, is dead and they are traveling to bury him, I believe. Elma, her maid Cora, and a bunch of guards. And she has um, somewhat of a friendship with Cora, but it's not really explored on page. It's just sort of told to us. Sort of how, actually, exactly how we're told that she has these three mothers who she was raised by, but we never see them on page. It's just told to us that these people are important to her, but we never really flesh it out. And of course, we're showing Elma being nice to Cora so that when Cora betrays her, it will hurt. But this wasn't done very cleverly because <laughs> pretty obvious from a mile away where we were going to go with Cora. So there weren't enough horses for Cora to ride. So um, they had a carriage and Elma's like, I am so nice. I will ride in the carriage with you. I'll ride in there with you. If it falls off a cliff or into a ravine, at least we'll go together. And these are like the very small ways in which we try to established that Elma cares about Cora. She wakes up, the carriage is stopped, maid Cora is gone, people are dead, she's investigating, she's looking around because she's smart, trying to figure out what the fuck is going on, why are they in the middle of nowhere, stopped, why is the carriage moving, why are people dead, and from the dark comes Astarian, except his name in this book isn't Astarian. Oh no, I've actually said his name is Astarian so many times I've now forgotten what his name was. Was it Rune? I feel like a lot of these these fantasy books, their their names are Rune. I'm actually gonna have to look it up. I don't remember his name. I just keep thinking Astarian and that's obviously wrong. Rune. His name is Rune. God, everybody's name is Rune now. So she's looking around and from the dark, a voice comes and it's Rune. And he's like, you're good at this. The voice so sudden in the quiet dark frightened Elma nearly out of her skin. Her pulse sped heart in her throat. Okay, so he's scaring the shit out of her, which... I dig that shit. Scare the shit out of each other. I dig it. Do it some more. And initially their dynamic's pretty good, but it, man, it, it fell off pretty quickly. And he's like, most of the time people make a break for it. Foolish. Or they try to fight me. Even more foolish. I can't guess what you'll do, which is exciting for me. And Elma's like, where's my maid? And he's like, I don't kill women unless I have to. So you kill women then. <laughs> 
<laughs> your maid is perfectly safe. I can't say the same for some of your guards, but they did attack me. And he's like, are you going to cry now? And she says, no. He says, good. It's off-putting. I'd rather enjoy this. So we're doing some banter here that I actually don't hate. I like it. I think it's good. Problem is that we didn't keep this up, and I was hoping that we would because this energy in this particular scene is great. This was a very vivid scene. This was a well-written scene. This is establishing how kind of creepy and gross he is. But when you establish that somebody is like kind of creepy and gross and then make him the love interest and you change his personality it's not fun anymore and that's unfortunately what happens here she asks who sent you and he's like well that's a boring question and I'm like is it <laughs> is it a boring question not for me somebody who's looking to understand the you know dynamics but all right and this is an important question for her to be asking unfortunately she stops asking it even after she hires him to be her bodyguard very confused all right he's like who do you think sent me she says I think you're stalling he's like how do you want to die and I'm like ooh. I dig it. What a gentleman. All right. And she's like, I want you in. <laughs> I need to get a cup of hot tea if I'm going to do this because it's, it's painful laughing this much. I want you inside me when you do it. I've always wondered what it would feel like to die at the height of pleasure. So he's about to, you know, fulfill that wish. And instead, she pulls out her dagger and stabs him in the neck. But he deflected it just in time that it's not going to kill him, but it did incapacitate him. So he's like ble bleeding out by the collarbone. He <laughs> it says, you tricked me. <gasps> As if it were the first time in his life he had been fooled. And then it says something that I was so fucking confused by. It says, he's like, well, you can't kill me. You don't know who I am. He's, she says, who are you? The man who killed the queen of Rothen. Now at this point, I'm thinking, but are you, so you killed her mom then? But apparently that's not what he meant because we never come back to this and say like, I guess I'm just stupid because I thought he was saying he killed her mom and then we were going to deal with this idea that this man has been sent repeatedly to kill her and her family but unfortunately not so okay I guess he just meant he was gonna kill her but then didn't I don't know it was a little confusing in how it was written she had cut him he's bleeding and it says at once Elma pulled back sick with herself sick with the seemingly endless gush of blood which was odd because I felt like we switched from this with her being sick at the gush of blood to being obsessed with his blood after this because she has like a sexual bloodthirst kind of thing going on which is fine I was just confused about why in the beginning she's disgusted by his gush of blood and then later she's like cut yourself while we're doing it I'm like wait we did a whole 180 here she tells her guards that assassin is the most important thing in the world to me keep him alive so she has them bring him as a prisoner so at this point we're asking the very logical questions who killed her dad why who's trying to kill her is it the same person is this is it the Astarian looking guy rune let's remind ourselves that he has a different name Rachel I'm I'm asking did he kill her mom if so why they have him bound and it says the assassin was bound so thoroughly that not even a sorcerer gods forbid might free him from the restraints I don't know this is what this is referring to there's no sorcerers I don't know why it says gods forbid I'm not really sure what sorcerers do in this world this is a book apparently someone I know has read this book and this author's other book and apparently this is set like hundreds of years before the author's other book in the same world so maybe sorcerers are bad and that's established the other book but I'm not sure because I have not read the other book this book in particular is a duology technically but it's not featuring the same characters and it's not written by the same author so two authors did a duology together I guess set in this world I don't think I'm gonna read the other one to find out <laughs> exactly what's what's the connection moving along she asked her uncle what are you afraid of that I'll conspire with him because her uncle Godwin does not want her to go talk to him and he's like for the love of the gods El be serious I'm concerned about your safety you're the queen and she's like yeah well fuck this shit and so she goes to talk to future bodyguard the assassin guy anyway and she's asking him pertinent questions which is great why would you try to kill me if not to take my throne to take Rothen the country she's from and it says he laughed a spluttering mocking sound the movement caused a shock of hair to fall over one eye and in that moment he looked truly feral a beast come down from the snow capped peaks to hunt Elma I actually don't hate this writing and he's like what would Slodava, the country he's from, possibly want with Rothen? 
My prince has no interest in your decrepit throne. I came to kill your father, Elma. I came for King Rafe's head, not yours. But you were all that was left, so I had to settle for the next best thing. I wish I had poisoned your father, but he died of his own accord, I'm sorry to say. You know, when I found out you were his only heir that I had to kill you instead, I was terribly upset. I'm not sure if this was supposed to be alluding to, like, the prince was the one who sent him, but it's never explicitly said. But he is the prince, and she doesn't interrogate this further, which I thought was weird. I don't really like when main characters don't ask very basic questions. Later in the same chapter is when she talks to Korra, her maid slash friend. She tells Korra, whose father had been stripped of his title and land decades earlier due to some minor indiscretion that even she couldn't keep straight. And she's like, I'll, I'll pardon your, your dad. And Cora's like, you'll pardon him? Elma's like, yeah, I'll do it without, you know, checking to make sure she can even reasonably do this. So she goes and talk to, talks to her uncle Godwin and he says, it wasn't some disagreement. I'm not going to speak about what Cora's dad did. I don't have the time or the desire. I'm sorry, Elma, but Cora's family will not have land. They'll never have titles again. Not while I have the power to keep it that way. I don't really understand the setup why she can't just be like, well, when I'm queen, I can do whatever the fuck I want. Wait, did she get crowned yet? Ah, oh, fuck. I don't remember. I don't know. All the politicking in this is pretty wishy-washy anyway. So now we're back at the Coliseum, the Ice Coliseum, where she is watching people people battle it out to the death gladiator style. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Rune is sent to the Coliseum to fight and he ends up fighting these twins, a pair of swift fighters who excelled at disorienting their opponents, yet even they fell before the Sladovan assassin as if their deaths were inevitable. It said the way Rune's body moved, it was unreal. He wasn't strikingly tall, nor was he heavily muscled like most of the arena's successful warriors, but he was fit, athletic, and flowed like water. What else could such a body accomplish if given the right opportunity? Ha! <laughs> I'm wondering too. I don't hate this. I will now be comparing every time the woman main character talks about the love interest body to fourth wing and nothing could be as bad or as vapid as fourth wing doing that about Zayden Ryerson. So this is fine. In fact, I thought that was kind of funny. She runs off for a moment and hears some of the advisors who advised her father talking and it says she's not equi equipped to wear the crowd. Blood be damned. She's never had the guts. I'm legally obligated to say guts like that. I'm sorry. But even if she were, she'll never call for war. She deflects, delays. If I'm going to be frank, it's a great pity the assassin botched the job. The way Ferdinand had spoken, it sounded as, a, as if as if the assassin had been hired by him and Bertram. And I'm like, whoa, that's a jump. That's, I don't feel that way at all. It sounded like he was talking generally. There was an assassin hired. The assassin botched the job. That That is the facts, ma'am. Like, that's what we, I don't know how we jumped all the way to you did it like whoa uh, okay she goes back to her seat you know next to definitely not Joaquin Phoenix <laughs> the uncle and she is about to watch Rune fight the biggest bad in the Colosseum who is known as the Fang who has a bunch of dogs which is kind of on the nose all right and she's like this dude is not gonna get his ass kicked by the Fang I know it but they don't end up fighting to the death instead she's like actually I want to hire that man as my bodyguard so you can pull somebody out of the Colosseum but you can't give somebody back their titles okay I'm not really sure the dynamic here by chapter 13 we have have gone from her being disgusted over his blood gushing out to her holding a knife to his throat and being like, well, I'll just read it to you. She was entranced by it. The contrast of red against his skin, the way he submitted to it, allowed it, his own fingers laying himself bare to her. And I'm like, fine, all good and fine. I just wish that we had established this earlier. When they saved the Volta thirst for blood, they weren't lying. So she hires him as her bodyguard. Cool. I don't really understand why she did this. Um, she still doesn't even... She She's not even asking anymore who sent him or why. I mean, she doesn't even ask anymore. She's just like, actually, you could be my bodyguard. Okay. I mean, you think that he was hired by those other two fucks to kill you. Why don't you just ask him? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. We just want to jump to the night to the throat bit. So we're not going to do, we're not going to answer reasonable questions. Got it. So she's sitting down. Her bodyguard is watching her. Have... <laughs> have a little meeting with her third cousin through marriage or some shit. And this woman's name is Lady Devereaux. <laughs> All 
I'm going to say here is that that is a very, very particular name. It is very, very French in a book where we have had names like Elma and Bjorn and Godwin, all which sound very English or um, Icelandic, I think. Uh, Lady Devereux is certainly a name, and it's very interesting that this particular character is an annoying piece of shit lady who just shows up to whine, complain, be told to shut up and eat cheese. So that's interesting. Moving on. And Cora comes to her and says, hey, I thought I saw somebody running through the shadows of the castle who looked an awful like a lot like a Sladovin, like, you know, your new bodyguard. And Rune's like, well, it wasn't me. I've been with her all fucking day. And this is where I was like, oh, so Cora is in fact lying about shit because she didn't get her the title. Got it. Awesome. He had white hair and blue eyes and a blade of ice. And the advisors who, you know, previously had talked about her not being right for the throne said, well, there you are, your majesty. Who else could it be but another Sladovan assassin? They would have our kingdom fall to rubble around our feet. So her main guard, Luca, goes and looks around for him. Rune goes and looks around for him. And guess who should find him but Rune. She sees them talking and she's like, Rune betrayed me. And it's like, well, I mean, he is your bodyguard who was forced into the job after he tried to kill you. Okay. Well, then he brings her this Slodovin's head. He'd killed the other Slodovin. He had not betrayed her. An unfamiliar feeling crept along her nerves, thick and honeyed. Her pulse was thrumming. She had never seen a severed head up close. She knelt to peer at it. Its skin was paler than runes. Its white hair duller, but it was obviously Slodovin. Even the eyes were blue. And I'm like, wait a minute. Never seen a severed head? Yes, you have. You told in great detail in like chapter one how you're dad brought you the severed head of your favorite guard. You explained it in very, very explicit detail. You have definitely seen a severed head up up close before. And then you've probably seen a bunch watching the Colosseum. Are you not entertained? I'm pretty sure you've seen some severed heads since I opened this book. Okay. And she asks, okay, well, Cora, my maid said he had an ice blade. And here's where we start introducing the idea of rhyme ice. And I didn't really understand what the point of this was. And by the end, I'm still asking that question. (laughs) What was the point? And I'm thinking that this is going to be like extremely important throughout the entirety of the book because it's literally called the Frost Queen's Blade, right? No, it is not important throughout the entirety of the book. It's important for all of like two seconds at the end. And Rune's like, if you take a look at this man whose head I just severed, his hair has been dyed and he does not have blue eyes like mine. Mine are bluer than his. He's not a Slodovin. This is a phony. I guess we have hair bleach in this world. I'm just gonna allow it. And it says, don't worry, I took the liberty of checking the hair between his legs before I turned his body over to your med and it didn't match. So the carpet didn't match the drapes is what he's saying. And she's like, you mean you have white like carpet? And he says, Yes, I'll show you later, you depraved thing. But first, care to shed any light on these events? Shed any light? This bitch doesn't know anything. And also, why did we just have a conversation about the color of your pubic hair? I did not need to be here for this. And she's like, well, I think that my invi- my advisors did this. And instead of just asking this man, who she believes was hired by these same advisors, hey, did these guys hire you? We just ignore that completely and go to, they must have done it. They must have sent this fake Sladovin to kill me. I, you, you, mm, Okay. My own advisors are so vile that they would knowingly sentence their own men, men of Rothen, to death just to steal a throne or to make a reckless attempt to obtain your cursed rhyme ice the ice blades. Rune said, good luck to them in their endeavor. I've only seen true rhyme ice wielded twice in my life. Basically, he's saying that rhyme ice is pretty rare. Again, I just don't understand why she's not asking very basic questions. Instead, we're we're establishing like, well, just to let you know, she doesn't trust this guy. She didn't trust Rune. There were very few people in her life that she did trust, and her assassin was not one of them. But she trusted in his loyalty to, Sl- to Sladava, his desire for peace. Uh, for peace? Did- Okay. Okay. Another guy breaks into her room. Okay. And he is like, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Rune comes in and the intruder, who is also Sladovin, this time for real, not a fake Sladovin, says to Rune, word came that you'd been captured by the Rothen filth. I came to retrieve you if you live. And well, King Rafe may be dead, but his daughter remains. I would like to remind you that she does not know this, but I know because it it was very obvious to me, though I don't think it was supposed 
supposed to be that this guy is the prince. Rune is the prince. And this man is talking to his prince like that. Rune uh, talks to this guy and he's like, what are you doing here? And he's like, word came from an anonymous source in Rothen, someone needing a job done. And your mother, Rune cuts him off there and says, isn't a fool. So whose idea was it? You're really starting to annoy me, Edvin. In no world would anyone in their right mind send you to buy a loaf of bread, let alone, you know, assassin, blah, blah, blah. He's like, you're, you're shit at your job. Why is she still alive? And Elma's like, oh, I've been betrayed. I'm like, wait, back up, back up, back up. You already said you don't trust him. You're just gonna, you're just gonna hear that Rune has a mom who's involved in this and you're not gonna put two and two together and think maybe Rune's the prince. You are really stupid. I hate when we give information that is so obvious to the audience and the main character, it just right over the main character's head. It makes me feel like I am dealing with some stupid bitches and I don't want to read about stupid bitches. I think I'm really stupid and I don't want to read about people who are more stupid than I am. His betrayal hung in her mind like a moat of dust as if if she were to touch it it might become true, real, faced with a real Slodov and his friend no less. Rune could have killed the other assassin at any time. The assassin Edvin goes to kill her, he's like choking her and Rune's like that's enough. They kill this guy, okay? And all of a sudden Rune does a complete 180 and now he's like obsessed with Elma. He's super obsessed with her. If he hurt you, oh no, you're safe, you're safe. His reassurance sounded like a prayer on his lips. Like, ah, where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? He, he's basically your prisoner. What? Elma could not bring herself to look away. Ruin the man who should have killed her, the man she thought had betrayed her. Instead, Ruin's own countrymen lay dead, his blood spreading across the floor. You killed him, she murmured. He deserved it, Rune breathed, and then they collided. So in a puddle of this man's blood, his countryman's blood, they're gonna fuck. And I'm like, okay, but this is coming out of nowhere. Like, I'm, I'm okay with it if this had been a man with no loyalties. But he is a man with loyalties. He's just gonna fuck in, in his friend's blood? I'm so confused. Instead of dealing with these, like, very obvious questions, we do a sex scene that isn't that bad, honestly. I need you to make me come. Is it blood that makes you want me? Or is it the danger you like? The brush of death that makes you wet? What? Wet? Both, she thought. God, you're soaking, sweet, depraved creature. I've never met anyone with such bloodlust. Uh, it actually uses the word clit, which fucking finally authors actually using words instead of like terrible, terrible euphemisms. If I have to read Bundle of Nerves one more fucking time, I swear to God, he goes down on her. Good for them. In the next chapter, all of a sudden, she's like, I hate you. <laughs> And I'm like, no, you can't fool me. We just, we just ended the whole enemies thing when he was like, if you're hurt, I would die. I can't handle it. I want to fuck you in my friend's blood. Like, please. I wish I hated you, he said. It would be easier. But you're not like your father. You've made that painfully clear. And even if you were, I, even if you were, I, even if you were, I, even, even if you were like your father, who I hate, I would still want to fuck you in a puddle of my friend's blood. What? Like, is that what we're saying? Saying? You don't take your impending rule lightly. I see it in you. Okay. <laughs> Um, that's really bare minimum, my guy. <laughs> Not me telling a man he, he deserves better, higher standards. Cora comes to her with evidence, a list of conversations that Cora overheard, and a list of monetary transactions between Rothen and Slodava. It's clear evidence, Rune says. Bertram and Ferdinand won't, ha won't have a chance of contesting it. Cora has more hidden away. And after the coronation, with that evidence, no one will be able to contest an arrest. And Elma's like, I'll execute them. Again, we are ignoring the fact that wasn't this, don't you? You think that this man was hired by these people? Why aren't you just asking him who hired you? What were you told? Where did the money come from? Okay. And she tells him, I'm anything but yours. And he says, if it makes you feel any better, Majesty, I am nothing if not yours. Again, this came out of nowhere. We fucked in a puddle of his friend's blood one time and he is obsessed. Apparently... <laughs> You know what? I'm not even going to make that joke. It's gross. She tells him, you can go. You're pardoned. I'll make peace with Sladava. You're free to go. And he's like, I'm actually not going to go anywhere, which good for her. We pay lip service again to Mekia, the place where she grew up, which we never really see. And we don't see her mothers who raised her there. It says, even after all these years, her heart was still in Mekia, in that beautiful garden kingdom with her mothers at Orchard House. Yet today she had tied herself inextricably to Rothen by being crowned queen. She finally gets crowned queen. I thought she did earlier. And this is where we start to see that we're 
we're trying to do this thing where we're like, oh, well, she doesn't quite fit the mold of what it means to be a Rothan queen because she was raised in Mechia. But I wish that we had actually seen this through flashbacks. Again, if this had been just like 75 pages longer, we really could have done a lot of work to like actually cultivate these characters, these themes, these ideas that we're doing with these characters where she's like, I'll never be good enough to be a Rothan queen really because I and my heart is in Mechia. But we forgot about Mechia for several chapters, like at least 15 chapters. So then she tells her men, her guards, her uncle, there's evidence to indicate that Sladava is open to a treaty of peace with Rothan, so I want to travel there. We get some more sex scenes where it's like, if I touch you, I won't be able to stop, and it's like, ah, oh, dang, you lost me, because now we're doing that stuff that sounds like borderline rapey. Like, you should be able to stop, though. If she says stop, you should be able to stop, so, ew. <laughs> so they start traveling from her country, Rothan, all the way to Sladava Slodava to go talk to the Slodava queen. On the way there, she is thinking about how her and Rune can never be anything more than a dalliance. A distraction, a pleasurable ride. He was Slodavan. Despite the fragile thing between them, until a peace treaty was signed, he was her enemy. Your enemy? You fucked him in a puddle of his friend's blood. Okay. She's talking to her actual guard, Luca, who comes on page, like, barely at all. Honestly, I forgot until I'm rereading my notes that he even existed because it's how irrelevant he is because again we didn't really cultivate our side characters very well here she's talking to him and then all of a sudden there's an arrowhead through his neck she gets attacked but not by the sladovin people and now's the part we're in chapter 26 now is the part where we start talking about rhyme ice oh they got attacked by highwaymen who were were alerted that they were coming and it's like who would have alerted them that they were coming well who knew you were coming your uncle duh <laughs> the queen of sladava wouldn't have seen us coming until we reached the frozen sea that's not enough time to organize something like that attack Anyway, it's not her style. And she's still on this idea that her advisors, Bertram and Ferdinand, who hate the idea of peace and that whose uh, dicks are kept hard by war, that they set this up, that they're the reason that she and her crew were attacked by highwaymen. They kill these highwaymen. They have another conversation about rhyme ice, which that's going to start getting more and more picked up, even though we are in chapter 26 out of how many chapters do we have left? 41. So... It's a little late to bring rhyme ice into this, but all right, sure. They're still on their way to go see the queen of Slodava, and it says that they see these animals out in the distance, and it says, one of the Slodavan queen's snowhawks she knows were coming. At this point, it's really weird that she has never asked Rune about his life. What's your family like? Are you part of a noble family? How did you become an assassin? Um, asking these basic questions and also asking basic questions about the fact that his friend showed up and was like, like your mother and then she never asks hey who's your mother why did that come up in conversation with that guy who uh we murdered and then fucked in his blood like but she just never asks <laughs> because basic questions why would we do that so then we get to the palace and this is when it is revealed that he is the prince elma says i had assumed that perhaps she colluded with my advisors that you were sent on her orders her orders absolutely not i left of my own accord hell-bent on disposing of your father after what he did to mine oh yeah her dad killed his dad that's why their countries don't get along. I had completely forgot about this because it's basically irrelevant. It was, regrettably, a mission of revenge. The fact that you overheard your advisors talking about me was coincidental, I'm afraid. I was a bit of a fool. And when I saw you for that first time asleep in that carriage, well, I knew what a cocksure dunderhead I'd been. Cocksure dunderhead? What the fuck? <laughs> As if I could have killed you. Oh, this is so annoying because I actually really liked that first scene. And so to like <laughs> retroactively be like, he never would have killed her, it kind of ruins it for me. So now seeing Slodava, she's like, well, I, Elma Volta, did you forget that was her name? Am such a good person. And I see Slodava and I am not bloodthirsty like my forefathers because I was raised in Mechia and that somehow made a difference on who I am. Until recently, her her father and the Volta name had kept her trapped in an unseen cage of inevitable cruelty, that being a queen of Rothen meant gripping her subjects in an iron fist, calling for blood with wild abandon. But now, seeing Sladava, its unearthly beauty, the people so unlike the thoughtless creatures her father had described, she knew what kind of queen she would be. And then she starts to ask basic questions. When were you going to tell me about rhyme ice? Elma asked, and he says, I'm shocked it took you this long to ask. Um, I hate that. I don't like when we do that, when we're like, oh, how funny that the main character didn't ask a basic question. Yeah, only because 
uh, to keep us from having necessary information longer. Not for any good reason. She saw him kill the highwaymen with rime ice. He says, I suppose you noticed it's actually magic, but why keep that a secret from Rothen? We've been at your doorstep for decades trying to steal it for ourselves. My father was obsessed with rime ice if he'd known it was magic. I'm like, wait, her father was obsessed with rime ice? Why don't we make this whole book about trying to steal rime ice? That would have been so fucking cool. And so he shows her how he makes rime ice appear, which is basically just like ice that turns into a blade. She asks how it worked, and this is where the book really started to take a turn for me. This is where it really started to piss me off. I think I could have rated this a three, but then after chapter 31, I was like, never mind, it's a two. Because she asks how it works, and he says, we don't actually know. Isn't that convenient? No! No, you don't get to hand wave away world building by making it so that even your characters say it's convenient that they don't know. No, no, that's so lazy. Please don't do that. All he says about it is that as far as he's aware, no one but Slodavins have ever accessed the power of rhyme ice. She's talking to the Slodavin queen, Rune's mother, and she's like, by the way, more of uh, people from your country have shown up under the banner of your uncle, Lord Godwin, who is very intent on war. And Elm was like, oh, well, I mean, I could just go talk to him. He's my uncle. And I'm like, mm, yeah, he's your uncle. In the same way that, you know, that guy Joaquin Phoenix played was also an uncle in Gladiator. And he didn't care about his nephew at all. <laughs> in two days, they're going to go talk to her uncle. But first, they're going to fuck and do some bloodlust stuff. So she like, you know, cuts him up while they're fucking and bloodlust. Good for them. I, I'm, I don't care. It's fine. I, I don't have any complaints about it. So she goes to talk to her uncle and immediately the dynamic between them has changed changed. Just like the dynamic between her and Rune changed very suddenly. A total 180. And I'm like, well, we didn't establish this beforehand, but okay. She's like, I see you brought an army to join me in my bid for peace. How unique. And he says, I see you brought your Slodavin prince plaything to meet with me. How quaint. And I'm like, what the fuck? When did this become y'all's dynamic? Y'all were fine with each other. What is happening? And he reveals all along, it's been him. It's been him who has set all this up. He killed her dad. He's been trying to kill her. He sent that fake Sladovin to kill her. He and Cora let the other guy in to, to kill her. Like, he's been behind all of it. Again, it just feels very contrived and lazy. We didn't establish this well enough beforehand, so it just feels like for shock value and sort of slap in the face as the reader. <laughs> And he starts to get really sassy with her and call her like a slota fucker for having been fucking that guy, uh, Rune. Which I'm like, wait, but at court, at the beginning of the book, y'all were not surprised to see Slodavin sex slaves. And in fact, a gift of an entire like group of Slodavin sex slaves was given to him. And nobody was talking about the word slota fucker then. So what the fuck are we doing here? When did all of a sudden we turn into a country who doesn't fuck Slodavins? Don't y'all have Slodovin sex slaves? What do you mean? Because the way it was established in the beginning made it sound like it was sort of like a, like a, an upper class thing to fuck Slodovin sex slaves. What the fuck? And he basically just talks shit to her. You're practically a child. Your father and I have given our lives to Rothen, bled and labored for the future of its people. You do not need to yoke yourself to the weaklings of the north. With rime ice firmly in the hands of the queen of Rothen, we could bend anyone to our will. I have not slept soundly since ordering your death. The, he tried to poison her. He tried tried to do the disguised Sladovin and then the real Sladovin and he's like join me under the Godwin banner I'm sorry I tried to kill you give up this silly dream of peace and it says more than rage she was overcome with grief Godwin had been like a father to her when hers was too busy with his duties as king he had trained her in combat offered advice shown her what it meant to be the Volta heir yeah and we never established him as like interested in war so this is coming out of nowhere I mean he was like vaguely interested in war but not to this degree what the fuck but Godwin had had never seen her as a loved one, a child, a girl who needed love and support. He had seen her as a figurehead, a bloodline, the wearer of the crown. I'm like, what? Since when? What the fuck? She's like, I'll spare your life if you agree to open negotiations with Sladava about the subject of peace or your life is forfeit. And he's like, no, he attacks Rune and he takes both of them back to Rothen, all the way the fuck back to Rothen to die in the gladiator arena. <laughs> hey. 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 
I should have seen this coming. I really should have. And of course, the fucking soldiers are now calling her a slow to fucker. And I'm like, w- again, I just don't understand where the fuck this came from, but all right. Cora comes to her and is like, I'm sorry, Lord Godwin promised to reinstate my father's title if I helped him. And I'm like, wait, but didn't Lord Godwin also say that he refused to reinstate the title because of something awful that happened that we still have not established? And this is, the ending of this is just a mess. Because now we have our main character, Elma, being like, I never made effort in those seven years, never set myself up to be a good queen. I cared only for myself and how lonely I was, how much I yearned for a life that had never been truly mine in Mechia. And I'm like, what even happened in Mechia? Because I wasn't there. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And also, you mean you've been back in Rothen for seven years? The fuck have you been doing for seven years? You've just been allowed to like fuck around and do nothing for seven years? Your dad didn't train you to be queen? What do you, what have you been doing? Like literally, what were you doing? And the fact that she didn't get sort of like indoctrinated into this like warmongering that the entire country, especially her own dad and uncle were a part of in those seven years, it was really confusing to me. Like what the fuck happened in Mechia that made her immune to that. This is where the <laughs> it starts to get a little too gladiator for me because her and Rune see each other in the dungeon and he's like, I'm sure they'll, that Godwin will stick me in the kidney right before the first fight just to make sure that he can't make it out alive. And I'm like, okay, let's not, let's not make it too obvious that this is gladiator. Like let's, let's chill out there for a minute. Smile for me now, Papa. <laughs> And he does, in fact, stab Rune before. (laughs) So, like, Rune somehow knew that that was going to happen, and he did. So what ends up happening is that her uncle somehow figures out how to use Rhyme Ice. After they have fought against the Fang, the guy with all the wolves, uh, her and Rune are, are fighting for their lives. He's already been stabbed. The uncle comes out. And apparently you can only use Rhyme Ice if you are, like, a true... What is it? Like, a true ruler? But the Rhyme Ice doesn't work for her uncle all the way because he's not good and she is. Oh, that's right. If you are crowned king or queen, then you get to use rhyme ice and she had let this slip to him and he now knew, okay, well, if I'm crowned, then I can use rhyme ice. And so when they get in this final fight, she's like, oh, you want to know why I'm still able to use rhyme ice even though you took my crown? She had no answer for this, but hoped the question might throw Godwin off balance. How should I know what capricious rules this magic obeys by as long as you're dead it hardly matters to me i'm like all right we're just the magic in this is just so it's so unexplained and so stupid and out of nowhere i mean we've only been doing rhyme ice for like a few chapters now and rune had told her well the rhyme ice will turn on you if your heart is ruined with greed or selfishness then you can't manifest rhyme ice properly the rhyme ice deems him unworthy it doesn't work out for him he dies In the epilogue, she's like, I want to marry you, Rune. And also, do you want my moms to be your moms? And I'm like, your moms? The ones we never saw? What are you talking about? He has a mom. You're the one that has no mom. What are you talking about? And she's like, you know, do you want them to be your moms? He says, I don't want to be your brother if that's what you're asking. And she's like, no, I want to marry you. Marry me, join our kingdoms, be my king, spend every day at my side and every night in my bed for the rest of your life. And he's like, I'll do it. I'll do anything you ask me to. Want me to declare war on my mother? I'll do it. I don't know when this man turned from I want to soak in your blood and kill you. It's so cute to hear you scream. I'm gonna fucking kill you to I'll kill my mom for you. Complete 180. And then we never see her moms adopt this man. Not that he needed to be because again his mom is alive. So and they live happily ever after I assume unless you know he does another 180 and decides actually I'm gonna stab you and like you know gladiators her back and, and then and she's, you know, like Maximus out in the field, the, the grass. Thinking of his family. God, I want to watch Gladiator. If I'm going to compare this to other fantasy romance books, oh, they're romantasy books, I'd say it's better than Fourth Wing. Uh, it's not as good as Forest of Dreams and Whispers, which is my shit, <laughs> but it is better than Fourth Wing. The line level write- writing is good. There are no anachronisms in this. There's no weird descriptions that leave me scratching my head. And I think that the sex scenes were well, well written, but again, I think everybody knows how picky I am about those. It's just underdone. It's just not cultivated. What's the point of this being a 
fantasy if the fantasy elements are so underdone, if basic questions don't get asked. I think that if we had had a couple more drafts in order to flesh out the fantasy part of the romanticy, this would have been way higher rated by me. Our main character feels like an empty shell with bloodlust. That's it. I really wanted more from her. We could have done more by establishing why she was so different from her dad and her uncle. What happened in those seven years, her personality was not affected because whatever happened in Nekia with her three adoptive mothers was so powerful that it wasn't tainted by seven years under her warmongering father. We're doing some unique concepts here. I just wanted more than surface level with them, but not fleshing out the world and the side characters and the stakes made the reading experience just collapse under the weight of very basic questions. Again, a couple more drafts and I think that I could have loved this. But if you do not need strong world building and character building in order to enjoy a book, you just want to like be in a fantasy setting and watch a romance happen and sort of let it wash over you and you know, get in, get out kind of thing. I think that it's a unique enough romanticy that you might be able to have a good time. For me, not so much. I wish that I had a better time, but again, like the ending, it just really started to go downhill there at the end. So that is my thoughts on the Frost Queen's Blade. Um, I gave it a two. It's a, it's a two. It could have been a lot better, I think. Thanks for being here. I appreciate y'all. Thanks for sticking around. If you stuck around uh, till the end, despite the change in scenery, uh, leave a snowflake down below. I'm I'm gonna go eat several fucking cough drops because my throat is absolutely fucking killing me. Thank you so much for asking. All right, thank you for being here. Um, let me know if you have read a decent fantasy romance recently because I am looking to give some five stars this year. Again, shout out to Forest of Dreams and Whispers for being the MVP last year. Okay, all right, thanks so much. Uh, I will see you next time. Comments and questions go down below. Bye. Before I go, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Therapy Bills patrons and those are Alexander. Brittany Bobitney, Cami, Choco's Waiting for Not All Men podcast, Chris, DJ Rogdibus, Ellie, Emperor's New Blues, Aaron with two E's, Eric, Ethel Go Lightly, Galaxy Bot, JC Murphy, Jack, Jess, Jesse, Jill, John E, Julie D, Kelly No K, Casey McKenzie, Kate W, Caitlin M, Quinn, Lady Kitty Bug, Lemon Jelly, Lex, Lily B, Max B, Mixer Boneless, Alice, Panoramic, Panoramic Demon. Oh man, wow, that was that was a mouth exercise. Rachel C, Rain, Reese, SJ, Samar, Scarlet, Shadow Auntie, Shiny, SMK, Spoopy, Steph, Two Orbit, Chai Guy, and The Salem T. Lynn. Thank you all so much for being here and for being a friend. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate y'all. And last but not least, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Potato Starch Marxist patrons. And those are Alicia, Amanda, Andy, Angelica, Anita, Artie the Ninth, Ashley, Ava, Ballads and Bookends, Beth, Blake Lemon Pants, Blythe, Bookish Bats, Bookish Brain Rot, Brie, Caitlin, Cardinal Ginger, Carlin. Also, if you can hear any sort of dragon ball stuff going on in the background of this right now i'm so sorry but my kid's home sorry carlin casper kate w Catherine, kathy chris cj clementine cole colleen corwin cosmic danielle Darren, Deborah, Diet Goth, Dilf Enthusiast, Dorian, Dorotea, Ebby, Ember, Emerald Dodge, Emily A, Emily L, Emma, Aaron, Ezra Moon, Fiona, Gadarn, you're gonna have to tell me how to say that, I'm sorry, Hannah C, Harvey Kiro, Haley, Ilianaka, India Inks, JM Tenet, Jay is on Olympus, Jelly V, Jen Michelle, Gender Queer, Jenny G, Justice Sue, Jillian, Jojo Bookish, Kai, Kat, Catherine, Katie, Kayala, Kendra, Kiara, Laughing Cat Dog, Laura G, Lauren G, Lazarus Ray, Library of Scars, Lindsay M, Lisa B, Lisa L, LP Aldiver, Lou Siri, Lustful Octopus, Martin, MV Marlowe, Madison, Man Eating Plant, Marcella, Marquita, Malara, Mentally Unwell, May, MK Books, Molly, James, Natalie, Never, Nicole G, Nicole R, Nyan Binary, Paige P, Penny Schilling, Fox Glove, Rachel B, Reba, Rebecca, Rivi, Ronnie, Rosie Thorns, Rowan, Sicoria, Sadie Selby, Sayer Riley, Sakia Lume, Samantha O, Sarah H, Sarah the Bay, Sarah Z, Shamed, Shannon, Sheen Onion, Sean, T. Delegati, Tay, Talia, Three Old Dogs, Tiana, Toast, Trash Can Teddy, Ty, Title Phoenix, Wiki Cherry, and Writer A. Thank you all so much for being here and for being a friend. Ooh.